Welcome, welcome, thrice welcome to JWC live stream, Joe's Riders Club live stream. This is Sublimated Posey with Ricky and David. I am Ricky. Uh, welcome uh, to, to the live stream. David, are you there? Yes, I am. <clears throat> wow, that is a marvelous thing to know. Um, I got a little bit of a bullfrog, folks, in my throat, so pay it no mind. Um, I think it's a seasonal allergies thing. Anyway, um, we live in a world of uh, hostility and adaptation, but creativity is the answer. JWC's uh, sub sublimated posy with Ricky and David is here to present uh, creativity as a solution to this uh, to this problem. Um, I am a creative obsessor. Uh, I've been writing all kinds of cool stuff for a while now, just having fun. Uh, what it boils down to is a bunch of novels and stuff. And I used to be a poet, um, vociferously proclaiming it, always, <clears throat> always with a notebook. But nowadays, uh, you know, or I should say lately, it's been like I 86 to all that. But ever since uh, I have come across uh, David Anderson, the poet, um, I have found that the, the transcendent muse has been uh, calling to me and waking me back up into the role of a poet. And I've been throwing down some poetry and just really thinking about it. Um, and how it improves language and, and why that's so vital for poetic voice fulfillment, that uniqueness uh, that the, the author has after many salty seasoned works where it's just, it's their voice on the page, powerful poetry in prose. Uh, that's always been my, my aim, but it's also great to wake up back into poetry too. Um, and I've been enjoying it. It's like remembering an old friend who just comes in out of the storm, you know? Um, so my creative life has been wonderful. Uh, despite all the bedlam and chaos in the world. David, how about you, man? How's your creativity been? It's been flourishing. Um, I've been very busy writing. Wonderful. I'm working on a, a epic poem for a novel that I'm writing, I'm co-writing. And oh. it's an epic fantasy uh, set in outer space with uh, pirates and um, nice. gods and goddesses. <laughs> And I am writing my poetry as well. Uh, so I keep a regular journal. Uh, the process of creativity is what gives a person like me a purpose and a reason to exist. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so you were mentioning you're doing a collaborative you're doing a collaborative novel and in that novel there's there's going to be poetry uh in that novel now tell us about that a little bit because i've always admired fantasy prose that had some poetry uh, marbled through it um just because of that and it's it's like another immersive effect to read a poem from another world written by a muse from another world it's like there's something uh, amazingly fascinating about that to me. Um, but, but what is your process? Uh, what, are, what are you working on? Well, uh, the poem is about the main character. His name is Jack. And he's also known as Granddad Jack. And it's about the first part I've written is about his conception and his birth. And in the second part, I'm going to go and discuss the, uh, the, his exploits on earth. And then at a certain point, uh, the third part will involve his history, uh, how he became to uh, occupy this uh, ship that is a ship of uh, dreams. It's a library of sort of imagination. 
And that's why I'm very excited about the concept. And I'm working with a very talented writer. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with him. <laughs> that's always helpful. That's always yeah. helpful. Yeah, he sent me, uh, just the other day, he sent me uh, several th- uh, several pages of just beautifully written prose. So I, he has my full confidence. Um, Excellent. Excellent. And I, I feel like it's going to be a great investment of my time. The whole project sounds like a, like a dream to me. I mean, the way you paint this ship and this, yeah. this mythical character and now there's a poem embedded in there. And yeah, I mean, this, this is what fantasy prose is missing. You know, you get these uh, pre-manufactured genre fantasy books and Hey, you dig it, dig it. All I'm saying is, is it's nice to vary it up with some experimentation every once in a while. There will be a great deal of experimentation. Um, the poem is reaching into the history, uh, the tradition of um, storytelling through verse. And it used to be that the storytellers um, kept the history of the people and they kept it in verse as an aid to memory. And the historians were poets. And they were called bards, and they had a serious uh, duty and role in society to record the history of the people. So I want to bring that into the novel. And there are some other literary uh, traditions that we will be doing in the novel, such as um, there's going to be a prologue. There will be uh, descriptions at the beginning of each chapter describing the action in the chapter. And I wanted to reach back to uh, the really high forms of uh, literature, uh, books like uh, Tom Jones by Henry Fielding. And I wanted to be full of action and um, comedy too, and exploits. I just wanted to be fun. And I, I think that's the whole purpose of, uh, of literature is that's one of them, I should say. There are other purposes, but one of the ones that's most appreciated by a general audience is um, uh, distracting oneself from one's um, occupation with their troubles and helping them find a new way to look at their life. So I have high hopes for the novel. I think it's going to do very well. I have a feeling you're... you're um your faith is well invested and I, I can foresee such a project bearing much fruit <clears throat> and just the idea that you're proceeding in this epic mode for the purposes of bringing an antiquarian flair um, to the overall project is like, it's exact, it's laser guided, man. It's, it's exactly what needs to happen. We need to go back. You know, I, I hear, um, I hear them beating their breasts uh, always about the archaic revival. For decades, they've been beating their breasts. And the only thing I haven't seen is that it's retreated into literature, you know? And it's like to write in that ancient mode, the ancient epic mythical mode, it's sorely needed. Um, I've been listening to the Silmarillion lately uh, on the audiobooks. It's just such a beautiful work. I mean, it's enchanting. You just get lost, helps the day go by, uh, helps, your, helps you get through your adaptive work, make your money so you can create. Um, beautifying uh, with its transcendence. And it's like, if we could touch, if we could even touch the hem of that robe uh, with your project, I think we'll do something fantastic. Um, so that's, that's great. Um, I'm, I'm really thrilled about that. And um, we will be keeping track of that project, folks, uh, because it promises so much, so much to teach and so much to show. Uh, <clears throat> today's poem uh, has been expertly picked. It is Ode to a Nightingale by John Keats. Um, I, I am not familiar 
with this particular poem, uh, but I will read it nonetheless, and we will see uh, what magic is there for us, uh, what, what there is to be learned uh, from a master. Um, so let's see. <clears throat> uh, I'll bring the screen up one second, please. Yes, yes, thank you. <clears throat> All right, I think we're Ex ready. Excellent. So, my heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains my sense as though of hemlock I had drunk or emptied some dull opiate to the drains. One minute passed, and Leithwards had sunk. Tis not through envy of thy happy lot, <clears throat> but being too happy in thine happiness, that thou, light-winged dryad of the trees, in some melodious plot of beechen green and shadows numberless, Singest of summer and full throated ease. Mm. Delicious. Oh, for a draught of vintage that hath been cooled a long age in the deep delved earth, tasting of flora and the country green, dance and provincial song and sunburnt mirth. Oh, for the breaker full of the warm south, full of the true, the blushful hippocrine with beaded bubbles winking at the brim and purple stained mouth that I might drink and leave the world unseen and with thee fade away into the forest dim. Wow, where have I been? I gotta get to this guy. Fade far away, dissolve, and quite forget what thou among the leaves hast never known. The weariness, the fever, and the fret. Here where men sit and hear each other groan. Where Paisley shakes a few sad last gray hairs. Oh, palsy, apologies where youth grows pale and specter thin and dies. Where but to think is to be full of sorrow and leaden-eyed despairs, where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes or new love pine at them beyond tomorrow. Away, away, for I will fly to thee, not charioted by Bacchus and his bards, but on the viewless wings of posy, ah, posy, though the dull brain perplexes and retards, already with thee, tender is the night. And happily, the queen moon is on her throne, clustered around by all her starry face. But here, there is no light, save from heaven, is with the breezes blown through virtuous glooms and winding mossy ways. I cannot see what flowers are at my feet, nor what soft incense hangs upon the boughs. But in em embalmed darkness guessed each sweet, wherewith the seasonable month endows <clears throat> the grass, the thicket, the fruit tree wild, white hawthorn, and pastoral eglantine, fast fading violets covered up in leaves, and mid May's eldest child. The coming musk rose, full of dewy wine. The murmurous haunt of flies on summer eaves. Darkling, I listen. And for many a time, I have been half in love with easeful death. 
called him soft names and many amused rhyme to take into the air my quiet breath. Now more than ever seems it rich to die, to cease upon the midnight with no pain. While thou art pouring forth thy soul abroad in such an ecstasy, still wouldst thou sing, and I have ears in vain, to thy high requiem become a sod. Thou was not born for death, immortal bird. No hungry generations tread thee down. The voice I hear this passing night was heard in ancient days by emperor and clown. Perhaps the self same song that found a path through the sad heart of Ruth. When sick for home, she stood in tears amid the alien corn. The same that oft times hath charmed magic ceasements, opening on the foam of perilous seas in fairy lands forlorn. Forlorn, the very word is like a bell to toil me back from thee to my soul self. Adieu, fancy cannot cheat so well as she is famed to do, deceiving elf. Adieu, adieu, thy plaintive anthem fades past the near meadows, over the still stream, up the hillside, and now tis buried deep in the next valley glades. Was it a vision or a waking dream? Fled is that music. Do I wake or sleep? Now that is, uh, that is a beautiful poem uh, without any doubt. Um, mesmerizing. A few of those verses, I tell you, um, enough to steal the breath away. <coughs> Particulars folded into the formalism and near epic mixture. Um, you know, the tidiness of the verse, the rhyme schemes, the, the, the conceptual rhyming, and the idea of him making that wine so magical with the winking bubbles at the rim and all these other things. It's just achingly beautiful, um, transcendent. I can see why Keats is so loved. Um, and there's just so much to learn. I have his volume laying around in my chambers. I have to go seek it out and, and pour over it uh, because that was just wonderful. Enough to pick up an afternoon that's lagging, certainly. David, um, what have you to say about this piece? I, I'm anxious to hear it. The, the fact of it's, um, it's, an, it's an enormous poem. Any poem by Keats is quite enormous, and a student can easily write a graduate thesis on just this poem, if you would choose so. Uh, the overarching things are mortality, um, the beauty and sensuous uh, nature of living. And if one knows the history of the poet, it makes it more uh, poignant and bittersweet. He died very young and he died in 1821 and he wrote this poem in 1819. And it uses a lot of uh, mythological references. So the reader will find himself having to refer to other books or going online to um, discover the references, but it's well worth the trouble. The overarching meaning to me is a, a great deal of sadness which contrasts with the beauty of the nightingale which is um, something that should be joyful and I think that what is really tragic about this poem is that it's often that the, the 
it's often misunderstood in, in very peculiar ways. And we don't have the time to go into those, but uh, there are just so many things that we can talk about. Um, there's this sense of um, fading away from life, as in uh, the fifth stanza. I cannot see what flowers are at my feet, nor what soft incense hangs upon the boughs. But in embalmed darkness, guess each sweet. Embalmed darkness. There's a sort of um, <laughs> approaching uh, dread, and he's wishing to feel no pain. His, uh, his brother died before him, also very young. And, and he would soon discover that he had tuberculosis. And uh, he died so young that it, to, to think that he wrote this in his 20s, in his early 20s, it just still astounds me. The, the high level of, of craft and um, the dense metaphor and the skillfulness that he uses uh, mythological subjects, for example. Um, it's a highly uh, romantic poem, but it's not sentimental which is uh, a quality that you expect from art, reserves um, a duty, reserves itself from a duty towards sentiment. Art seeks something <clears throat> much greater than uh, sentiment. So um, uh, it, it, does, I, it does. I could talk uh, for hours about this poem and possibly bore your listeners. So I just wanted, the reason I chose this poem is because of its sensuous nature. And actually, when we look at the prose example, you, uh, you will notice that there is mention of uh, death in the prose example. So there's this sort of uh, connection on a sensuous level of the sensuousness of, uh, 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 of life, of living, and the uh, brevity of it that it's always there around us waiting. And um, uh, j the, in the example by Joyce, you'll see it very clearly and, and plainly put in a less uh, a poetic way, but as dense and as rich as the Keats, in my opinion. Well, I value that opinion immensely. And furthermore, what I would say is we may not have time to deconstruct this poem thoroughly on this show, but do promise me uh, that you will um, have a workshop or maybe at the after Zoom one day we could do that deconstruction because I think anyone who's, who's deep into poetry would love to hear uh, what you have to say about that. And, and again, remember our, remember, I mean, I'll, I'll speak for myself. My poetry at 20 was an agony. It, this is timeless and immortal and, and beautiful. Um, and really just uh, haunting and, and there's so much communicated. The idea that at 20, that he was capable of this, I mean, certainly the generational wheel spun differently back then. Uh Death concentrates all life and all meaning and abilities and talents. It, it defines life. Death defines life. And I think that's another good reason to read poems like this. Um, so we can cherish and celebrate uh, the pleasures of life. So this isn't solely just about, um, for him, it's about a, a, a dying but for the reader, it's about um, appreciation of fine wine or food, um, the, the scent of a flower, whatever brings you great pleasure in life. It, it, it gives it more meaning and more power when we understand the brevity of it. And this is a, a theme that goes throughout poetry and throughout literature, actually. Uh, Shakespeare wrote about the, the, the power of beauty, but the brevity of it, and the fact that uh, things have a, a, a limited number of days of existence. So 
I'm going to be quiet because I could talk about this until. No, people. no. I mean, it's, but it's it's a very it's a wonderful subject, and it's also a very tragic and sad one. But it, it's why I chose these two. You'll see when we get to the pros. Finitude and mortality. Finitude and mortality, children. That is why we must savor each beat of our hearts. And that's what Master Keats is trying to communicate, I think, in his own way. Uh, much to be learned there. So now we turn to our prose segment. First. And then there's a piece of poetic prose for the purposes of poetic voice fulfillment, something that we aim for at JWC, the uniqueness of one's voice on the page, poetic wordplay, as I once heard a wise man say. This prose example will be taken from Ulysses by James Joyce. This is uh, chapter eight. <clears throat> Mild fire of wine kindled, it, kindled his veins. I wanted that badly, felt so off color. His eyes unhungrily saw shelves of tins, sardines, gaudy lobster claws, all the odd things people pick up for food. Out of shells, periwinkles with a pen, off trees, snails, out of the ground, the Frenchie out of the sea with bait on a hook. Silly fish learn nothing in a thousand years. If you didn't know, risky putting anything into your mouth. Poisonous berries, Johnny Magoris, roundness you think good. Gaudy color warns you off. One fellow told another and so on. Try it on the dog first, lead. Led on by the smell of the look, or the look. Tempting fruit, ice cones, cream, instinct. Orange groves, for instance, need artificial irrigation. Bleeb troustals. Yes, um, that word is uh, beyond me. Yes, but what about oysters? Unsightly like a clot of phlegm, filthy shells devil to open them too. Who found them out? Garbage, sewage they feed on, fizz and red bank oysters. Effect on the sexual, Aphrodite. He was in the red bank this morning. Was he oysters old fish at table? Perhaps he young flesh in bed, no June, has no R, no oysters. But there are people like things high, tainted game, jugged here, first catch your hair. Chinese eating eggs 50 years old, blue and green again. Dinner of 30 courses, each dish harmless, might mix inside. Idea for a poison mystery. That Archduke Leopold, was it no, yes, or was it Otto? one of those Habsburgs, or who was it used to eat the scruff off his own head? Cheapest lunch in town. Of course, aristocrats, then the others copy to be in the fashion. Millie too, rock oil and flour. Raw pastry, I like myself. Half the catch of oysters they throw back in the sea to keep up the price. Cheap, no one would buy. Heavy R. Do the grand. Hawk in green glasses. Swell blowout. Lady this. Powdered bosom pearls. The elite. Creme de la creme. They want special dishes to pretend there they are. Hermit with a platter of pulse. Keep down the stings of the flesh. Know me, come eat with me. Royal sturgeon, high sheriff. Coffee, the butcher. Write to venisons of the forest from his ex. Send him back the half of a cow. Spread I saw down in the master of the rolls kitchen area. 
white-hatted chef like a rabbi, combustible duck, curly cabbage, a la Duchess de Parma. Just as well to write it on the bill of fare so that you can know what you've eaten. Too many drugs spoil the broth. I know it myself, dosing it with Edward's desiccated soup. Geese stuffed silly for them. Lobsters boiled alive. Do partake some partimigan. Part part Wouldn't mind being a waiter in a swell hotel. Tips evening dress, half naked ladies. May I tempt you a little more filleted lemon soul, Miss Dubidi, Dubidat. Mm. Butchering that. Ooh, forgive me. Yes, do be dad. And she did be dad, remember? Do la French. Still, it's the same fish, perhaps, old Mickey Hanlon of Moore Street ripped the guts out of making money, hand over fist, fingers and fishes. Gills can't write his name on a cheek. Think he was painting the landscape with his mouth twisted. Muikil, a achia, high ignorant, as a kish of brogues worth 50,000 pounds. Well, I did my best, but I doubt I did it justice. I think you did do it justice. There's much sophistication there and a lot that is haphazard in the dialect that he's writing, which I'm, of course, I had heard about Joyce. Um, I, I dig the beats and Jack Cowrack. I mean, he laid his quill and ink down at the, at the foot of Joyce. He couldn't say enough excellent things about him and proclaim not that he's derived from him, but he, that he certainly is moved and influenced uh, by him, I, I, apparently, especially in the late works of Jack Cowrack. Um, and I, I certainly enjoyed the passage. Probably got to give that cat a, a, a more fair shake. I put him down too hasty. Um, but I did enjoy it. I mean, the little things that are going on in there about the um, meat hook realities of uh, the fisherman's trade and how we're just consuming things, how human beings devour, you know, and, and the, uh, the organic processes and um all these things going by there's a sort of there's a sort of radiance and a sort of monstrosity at the same time um when it comes to food and all those environs that he's alluding to um but i am impressed more so than i thought i would be um how about you david what do you have to say about this piece um i chose it because I like seeing people get uncomfortable after they're comf comfortable. Mm -hmm. the, the very fact that people don't put much thought into where their food comes from, uh, this sort of lays it out on the page in a very playful way with that the language play that we speak about. And it has a kind of raw stench to it, a, a sticky, slimy, <laughs> oozy, filthy honesty that is just I mean, it, tur it turns me on and I guess that makes me a freak but I really love choice and um at least their have, own yes I mean I think this is proof that I had a teacher who once said one great novel or poem is like a school and it's the only schooling you will need mm. And um, I think this is an example of that. Joyce is, it uh, has fallen uh, um, on the list. Ulysses has fallen on the list at the top of the list for most critics for the past hundred years and for good reason. Yes, I've heard. So I've yeah. heard. Yeah. So, I mean, it's really death adjacent, this section, because we have to understand that we enjoy the food that we're eating, but something had to die for that food to be uh, come to our plate. And um, I, I just love it. 
I, I, it's probably not for everyone's taste. It's a, I understand people's reaction to Joyce. It's hard sometimes. It's just, he let loose and he didn't care what he did to grammar, English grammar. And that's another reason I uh, really uh, appreciate him as a master. Uh, have the tools, learn them as your grandfather knew them, and then smash those tools to bit and build your own. What, what I've noticed is that he has a voice, a very well-defined voice, but his voice has an accent to the point of where the overall prose, it's not that it's narrator, it's not that it's dialogue, it's that it's it, his, his voice itself is so accented by local flavor and by the, uh, the voice of the street of his time. And he cares nothing, whether it's accessible or not. And that's why Jack must have loved him so, Jack Calrack, because he just, uh, the things Joyce was accused of in his day, Jack was likely also, the insults were thrown at him likewise. And I don't know how popular Joyce was in his day, uh, but Jack was controversial and he followed the same principles. So the concept of an accented voice is something that I've also toyed with. But I must say that if you submitted a manuscript like this today, I think it would go over like the Hindenburg. I think the editor would want to rip it to pieces and make it clear. <laughs> and it's like yeah. such yes. genius, such genius would get plowed away so that the street might be clear as it were. And it's like, clearly there is error there in such thought. <laughs> like, I'm not saying, I'm not saying this is bread and butter for me, but this is something to be learned from. And what a brilliant piece, you know? So much crammed in there, so much, so much flavor and culture and just mystery in all that, uh, the way that it sounds you know, baffling in some places because of how, how, uh, how direct it is and how he's, it's, it's like you're listening to someone talking like in a tavern or sitting by a dockside or on a carriage moving through the countryside. It's like you could be having a conversation uh, in a dream and it wouldn't sound so, so smooth as this. And it's just, how do you get away with it? You know what I mean? Um, now, it, I mean, I mean, nowadays, that's what I'm it's, asking. Um, it's the secret, I think, is joy and joy in ugliness and beauty and mm. finding beauty in ugly things and truth in ugly things. Mm. That's something that um, I think as Americans, we can learn to do better. Yes, Culturally, right. right now, I think we have a, a real problem with them. Um, um, the, the truth of life in all of its aspects and literature, great literature like this can help us. It's not that there isn't literature today that's being written that can't teach us this, but I just want to steal his game. <laughs> I read a passage like this and I just want to steal it from him because I will never be able to write something as immense and this is a, an immense love of humanity and with all of its warts and its uh, flaws and its peccadilloes. And mm -hmm. it's just pure, it's pure uh, joy and pleasure. There's a voice, there's like a boisterous uh, confidence that comes from the very first page and it runs throughout the novel. And it's quite a lengthy novel, but it's just, um, I wanted, that kind of uh, sensual, uh, I want writers to think with their bodies and not just their minds. And so that's one of the reasons I chose this. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's obvious. There's so much to learn and Joyce was so courageous to be able to throw that down. It takes courage to walk past what's expected in an industry and to lay it down anyway and, and, and reinvent the wheel. Um, yeah, you know, say what you will. There, he has his critics too, but it's beautiful. What we just heard was beautiful, and and it was because of its its directness and its honesty and its ugliness that it was so beautiful. A breath of fresh air on the page, 
um, cinematic atomic existence unfolding, um, such a record preserved. And I dare say that when it comes to this whole uh, project with your granddad, Jack, uh, that writer will probably be leaning into some of this method if he has not already. Um, the notion of an accent in the voice, um, you know, I don't know that he could be so bold, but even if he takes, like I said, even if he grasps at the hem for but a moment, you leave it to the transcendent. You never say it cannot be done because it's not you doing it. No, no great writer, no great poet is, is the wine. They're just the cup. There's a very famous quote by um, the author um, uh, George Orwell from Down and Out in Paris. He said, and I'm paraphrasing, the more, uh, uh, the higher the price of your food, the more sweat, blood, and spit has gone into it. And I thought of that when I was um, selecting this passage because rich people, they eat the kind of stuff that he was talking about, you know, like the stuff that uh, poor people would throw out and think is disgusting, the guts, you know, the, uh, the livers, you know, the, all of those organs that uh, would not uh, seemingly be of interest that's the kind of thing that rich people what is uh what is uh, foie gras made out of it's made out of liver right so what, it's, a, um, what, what what is it a pate or something yeah like that? it's like a pate yes basically mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a it's a rich man's um pate but my father uh every my mother would buy uh, chickens from a local uh, woman and she would wring the necks of these chickens in front of us. And then my mother would take them home and rip the guts out and cook the liver and internal organs for my father with onions. And I would sit and watch my father and I hated it, the smell of the onions in the liver and, and he delighted in it. So um, I also think about that one. I read passages like this. So there's something there for everyone. They just have to, they have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah, I hear once you get into liver and onions, it's the magic you can never, you can never withdraw from. It's not the first time I've, I've heard it said. Yeah. Um, and uh, certainly if you eat all this stuff, you'll end up in gout or at least as big as me. Um, and that's not necessarily to be desired, but it is good to, uh, smell the roses every once in a while. And if you like liver, eat liver while there's liver to eat. Um, well, this is a fantastic episode we had here. Um, learning so much, uh, as we did. And, um, thank you for picking those passages and, uh, I guess, you know, the commonality, um, just to go over it really quick, sensuous imagery and poetic stream of consciousness. Just give us a few ditties about that before we uh, take our leave, David. Uh, stream of a stream of consciousness um, is a, a form of writing where the words are sort of just thrown down on the page without much attention to um, what we would think is logic or um, a description of a scene. So it's sort of like the rambling mind of someone who is unable to um, organize their thoughts in a certain way. Another good, great writer who did this was Virginia Woolf and she's coming up in the series. She wrote in Stream of Consciousness. And uh, what I mean by poetic stream of consciousness is just the highly, it, it, the high density of imagery in this particular passage and the sensuous na uh, nature of it. Uh, sensuous, of course, refers to anything that can be perceived through our senses, as opposed to sensual, which um, typically uh, refers to sexual. 
But in the case here, we're talking about uh, our taste, our sight, uh, sound, and all of those things that uh, make uh, our uh, perception of the world around us. So when I say use your body to create, I mean that in a literal way. Go for a walk and um, amazing things will be happen if you open yourself up to what's going on around you, as opposed to staying closed in, in your own mind and not uh, uh, being afraid. So it, it's a very easy thing to do in the city. If you live in the countryside, it's a different trip altogether. Beethoven went for long walks and he wrote the Ninth Symphony, which is probably the great, one of the greatest artistic achievements ever. So, um, <laughs> Just open yourself up, and if you see that something that's unpleasant, that is the beauty that you're meant to see. If you see a rose, that is the beauty that has been presented just for your pleasure. I want people to think in those terms, and I think they will uh, practice it. It's, a, it's, a, it's like exercise, it's like a, any skill you can acquire it if you want. If you want to, the point is to have fun. This isn't a competition. This isn't an exercise to get truth. It's, and the purpose of art is to be alive. Yeah. Uh, so you heard them folks, get out there with your sketchbook, with your notebook, write down, an industry, a culture, go to a garden, go to the seashore, go to a park, go to a, a go on top of a building and look over a cityscape. Get it down, get your sensorium down in a stream of consciousness, write it down and reach, reach for that transcendent mode uh, that Joyce and Keats demonstrated. Um, time flies when you're having fun, folks, and, and we're already done with today's episode. But before we go, we want to do some plugs. Um, this is JWC live stream. That's Joe's Writers Club live stream, sublimated posy with Ricky and David. Um, this show is really fun. I just really love doing it. We love presenting it to you. If you want to be part of it, uh, go to our YouTube uh, channel, go to all our social medias, like and subscribe, um, share us, help us to get exposure so that we can, uh, we can present this type of poetic analysis and striving for the transcendent. It's desperately needed in today's world. Uh, sign up as soon as possible at joeswriters.club. That's Joe, joeswriters.club. Um, in moments, we will be ending the live stream and we'll, we will be going to the after Zoom meeting. Um, and we would encourage you to come join us. joeswriters.club, sign up and head on over. Um, you could bring some poetry to read. There may be poetry read. That's the general um, purpose. But we'll be talking about all kinds of cool stuff too. Uh, so help Joe's Writers Club in any way you can. Sign up at joeswriters.club. And thank you very much for listening. Um, I have a book of posy that's on the way. Um, it's a bunch of my old stuff, moldy oldies, but worthy. Um, it'll be here soon. Um, and then I would plug that also, but Joe's Writers Club, folks, this has been JWC live stream, sublimated posy with Ricky and David. Thank you so much for listening and join us at the live, the after Zoom uh, after. Farewell, all.